Mine is that we're getting uh, within 25 basis points of the Fed uh, stopping tightening. So I think there'll be another 25 basis point points. The problem is a lot of the gains we've just seen are year on year gains because of what happened this time last year, the food and energy and so on. And that the problems will arise for the markets in that I don't see the Fed cutting rates quickly after that. It'll be well into next year. So it's not like a Goldilocks scenario where rates are coming down and growth is going up. What we're going to be looking at is growth pretty static and rates not coming down, which uh, raises the question of uh, how do you get the inflation rate from 3 or 4.8, depending on whether you're an addict, a headline or core, how do you get it back to 2% without a long period of of pain or do you simply change the goalposts or change the goalposts without really saying so which is what i think central banks are going to do uh, david there is a view though that the central banks are going to effectively overdo it to lob too many increases we're still seeing the impact of that lag effect so they're going to overdo it triggering some form of a recession the other version is they undershoot and they just don't get a handle on inflation and it just lurks and lingers for much longer than anyone wants it to what are the risks the upside downside risks here and which one would you opt for if you could overdo it or underdo it at this point uh, I, I think the real fear is the fact that they could cut too early and be the culprits of engendering higher inflation for a second time. So I think if anything, they will they will stay the course. Now, will that produce uh, uh, deflation? Will that produce a uh, recession? I actually don't think so. And the reason for that is that labor markets and disposable income, what people have to spend, are behaving differently this time. In other words, you are seeing a gradual reduction in demand for labor, a gradual reduction in hourly wages. But you are not seeing the sort of catastrophic collapse in employment, which would create, uh, would create a recession. So I think they're going to hang into the course. And I don't think there'll be a global recession, with the exception possibly, you know, of individual countries like, uh, like China. David, my friend, uh, lovely to speak to you from Vilnius here. I was reading your piece on the, I think it was the 25th of June, called Moscow Red Sky at Night, and you were analysing the collapse of the Wagner coup uh, and the empowerment of Ukraine. Well, here in Vilnius, I've had an opportunity to speak to an enormous number of world leaders, and, and it does look like, despite the fact that they're not getting membership, that the Ukrainians are getting most of what they want as well. I just wondered what your view is on the situation going forward regards the Moscow dynamic uh, and indeed the the rest of the world? Well, first of all, the only thing we know about Moscow is that it's an unstable regime. We're not sure how unstable it is or how far Putin is going to be able to go. But we simply do not understand or know what is happening. The second thing I would say is the deal that was struck in Vilnius gives Ukraine more arms. The response of Russia to that will also be to give their troops more arms. So you're actually looking at another step up the escalation ladder. Uh, this does not de-escalate the war, it escalates the war. And if you look at what Ukraine is getting, it's not getting the long-range missiles, which would make it a real uh, winner of this war. We're still arming Ukraine to, to continue to not lose this war, but we're not arming it to win this war. And I think that is a very important shortfall. Third of all, if you were, uh, Steve, going to finance the rebuilding of Ukraine, you would not put a penny into Ukraine unless it had long-term guarantees from, from NATO because your war investment could be wiped out. So it's often ignored, but it's very important. Uh, is NATO fulfilling the guarantees which are necessary to get the private sector to step into Ukraine? And I think the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would say if you're, if you're Moscow, uh, all you have to do is to keep the war boiling in Ukraine. Uh, at some degree, and who can define war, but you have to keep it going, because as long as you keep it going, then NATO will not accept Ukraine as a member, which, which is really empowering uh, Russia to not only maintain the war, but to escalate the war. So yeah, we've seen Sweden coming into the alliance, and we've seen uh, uh, Turkey seemingly changing direction and supporting uh, the West much more openly, but we have not seen the real clincher which is a security issue for Ukraine. Article 5 is needed for Ukraine.